Hi everyone and welcome. Today I would like to talk to you about my sabbatical projects on the Internet of Things and security. So a sabbatical is a way to be able to work on a project that you wouldn't normally be able to have time on. In my case, I have chosen to work on the Internet of Things and how it relates to security. And for this particular project, I ended up working a lot with open source materials. But first, I want to just go over quickly, what is the Internet of Things? So the Internet of Things is really anything that is connected to the Internet that may or may not have human interaction, but generally has some sort of specific purpose or specific purposes. So we're not talking about like, you know, for example, like laptops. Really what we're talking about is things like thermostats or refrigerators or washers and dryers. Uh, a lot of people at this point in time do have Internet of Things items in their houses. So if you have a Ring doorbell, a Nest thermostat, an Amazon Echo, uh, any of the Internet connected like Fitbit, Garmin wearables, Google Home, any smart lights, then you probably have some Internet of Things devices in your house. Now, the reason we talk about security for the Internet of Things is because this is actually a huge issue. So the big problem is almost all of these devices that I was talking about, for examples, are done by really big companies. They are commercial devices. You know, at the end of the day, their purpose is to make money. And in a lot of cases, they are actually sold at a loss because the extra money that they need to produce the device is made up by spying on you and selling your data, selling your behavior, and all of those kinds of things. So there's that problem with the security of the Internet of Things. But the other problem is that a lot of these companies that are creating these Internet of Things devices will either not care about security or make them insecure on purpose. So all of these devices that are commercially done devices, almost all of them will actually send your data to the company that creates the device. That is part of how they have put together these devices very much on purpose. And part of the user agreement that you sign is saying that you're okay with that company having all of that data and they can sell the data. Most of the devices that I research actually have problems with collecting the data, sending the data, not doing it very safely. And a lot of them actually have back doors installed on purpose in a way that cannot be fixed so that the company can access them and you can't stop them. So sometimes it's for things like testing. The company will put these back doors in so they can do testing and troubleshooting. Sometimes it's just easier for them. Sometimes it's that it just never occurred to them that anybody would care. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different reasons. But basically, if you don't know where your data is, what data is being collected, or who actually owns your data at the end of the day, that is something that should concern you. And you should at least be able to answer those questions. Most of those devices are not going to focus on security because security is expensive and it gets in the way of the secondary market of selling data. Because these companies are offsetting the hardware costs by selling your data and behavioral information and all of the things that you do with their devices, they really have no incentive to make it secure, make it protected, and make it so that you know your data and information isn't able to be sold. So for my sabbatical, I ended up working on quite a few different projects, and I'm going to go through all of these a little bit more. But for all of these different projects, um, I actually have write-ups so that if you wanted to do this at home, you would be able to. So every write-up is structured so that I have a section for ratings, um, difficulty, cost, and skills needed. So these projects are actually in a variety of skills required, cost ranges, and sort of difficulties. 
If any of these are skills that I have open educational resources or OER for, then I've linked to that within my write-up because the website that I did all of these write-ups on is actually also how I publish my OER work. Each of them has descriptions, troubleshooting, suggestions, stuff like that. So like as I was going through the project, some things that I wanted to know were things that might have been confusing. And then at the very end, there's a table with a cost breakdown and it will have links to some supplies. Now, in some of these cases, these were supplies that I bought. In some of these cases, these are supplies that I would buy if I needed to restock. But in a lot of the cases, I actually had a bunch of these supplies at home because of projects that I like to do. So I didn't need to necessarily go out and buy some of it. You know, like wires, I didn't need to go buy. I have a whole selection, but like I didn't have, you know, CO2 sensors just lying around at the house. So the first project I am going to label as sort of a really great beginner project. So this IoT smart home kit, you can actually just buy the kit like on, you know, like Amazon type of big box store. And it has everything you need. So if you just wanted to say, try working with some Internet of Things devices, see how some of this hardware works, interact with it. Maybe um, either you have a kid or you hang out with some kids or you wanted to do something as a class, then these kits kind of have everything all in one. It's designed as a tutorial. So if you can basically like plug a cable into your computer and you can install a program, you can do this kit. There's a complete walkthrough of how to put everything together, how to install the software. Um, and if you can you know, plug in a cord and install, you can do this. It looks kind of complicated, but it's actually really not. And then you can interact with each of these different pieces. Uh, I think that this would actually be a really great confidence builder if you are not necessarily comfortable working with computers or IoT devices. Um, and if you had people that you wanted to sort of share this information with and you didn't necessarily know what to do, this can be a really good starting place. The Magic Mirror project that I did. Um, so this is, I, I, I want to be clear, I made a Magic Mirror for my home, but this project is actually an incredibly popular project that somebody else has put together a bunch of information for that I'm piggybacking off of. So this project actually has a very robust community, like very robust. There are forums, there are videos, there's a bunch of people working on this. They are trying to make it as accessible as possible to everybody. There are lots of people that have done all kinds of different, really interesting things with this project. And the basic idea behind a magic mirror is you can do this either with like a monitor or a tablet. You put some glass in front of it, the um, you know special mirror glass, and then you can have information projected behind the mirror. So you can have things like your calendar, inspirational quotes, countdowns to stuff. Um, so like for example, uh, we actually ended up putting this in our kitchen. So you can see things like as you're going out the door, you know, what is the schedule for the day? What are some quotes that we have? Um, I'm not saying I have a retirement calculator on there, but I do show how to make one if that's something you are interested in. Um, and you can do it with like, you know, years, days, whatever. But this is actually really customizable. And this could be good for even some like younger preteen adolescent kids if you wanted to do that with them. You can do this with an old tablet, which you could get super cheaply. This project can be done for under 100 bucks really easily. You can make it more complex. You can keep it really simple. You can use pieces that other people have done. You can write your own code for it. Like this is a very, very scalable project. Um, the only sort of note that I have here is if you're using glue in a frame, make sure that you're watching whoever is doing this because you do not wish to be getting glue out of other people's hair. It is an unenjoyable experience. Okay, so uh, one of the other projects that I did was actually setting up a CCTV system in the house. Now, um, obviously, because I'm me, the priority was 
That's right, for my dogs. So um, setting up secure cameras so that I can watch my dogs while I'm out of the house was obviously one of my very high priority projects. And I went through a couple of different ways how to do this. For setting this up, this is as a, an option to if you did not want to have another type of, you know, like let's say ring doorbell set up. For these cameras, you can actually set them up indoors or outdoors depending on the camera that you buy. Adding these secure cameras can be very straightforward. You can also make it a little bit more complicated. You can kind of scale it up if you want. But making them secure, making sure that you are picking ones that are not vulnerable by default and getting good passwords is actually really important because security cameras were actually one of the really, really popular I guess, hackable devices where people are actually able to watch cameras from around the world because there was a backdoor put in with some default passwords such that you could basically log in and get rude access to people's cameras everywhere. And a lot of the cameras will also do absolutely horrendous things like require that you punch through your firewall to be able to even get access. A lot of them will do awful things like requiring that you use an app or requiring that you log on to a company's web portal so that you have absolutely no control over everything, which is like extra super creepy if you have literal cameras in your home. Um, so setting up your own cameras can be a really good project to do. Um, the safest way to do this is actually set them up on your own network. You can do a second Wi-Fi or a PoE system. A uh, PoE system was actually one of the other products that I put together. A PoE system sounds really scary, but it's really not. So power over Ethernet. Um, most of you have probably seen the cables that you use to plug in to get internet, like for desktops. Maybe you plug in your laptops. Um, Cat5 or Cat6 cables. But what's actually kind of cool is you can make your own cables. And this, again, it sounds scary, but it's really not. This is actually something that we do as one of our activities in the Networking One class. Um, and, you know, the kids have never done it before. They learn how to do it, and then they can take their cables home that day. Um, and so you can make your own cables, save some money. You can buy your own cables. But, like, literally, if you can plug in a cable you can do this project. And the way this works is it literally just means that you can send power over the ethernet cable as well as internet. So like if you wanted to say run cameras for looking at your dogs, you could just have that one cable going from the camera to the switch. And as long as you're careful about buying the right kind of switch, which I talk about in my write-up, then it's really easy. You can just plug and play. Um, you can also do this for like example birds or animals. So if you live somewhere rural enough and you're into bird watching, you can actually go set that up. Um, if you haven't gotten into bird watching yet, again, I guess wait a little bit because it turns out as we get old, we turn into bird watchers. I don't know what happens, but that's just how the, the world goes. Um, okay, so home server and virtualization. <laughs> this is a more complex project. Um, it is still a useful project. I think that it has the potential to be really awesome for a lot of people. And being able to control the back end for a lot of these IoT projects is actually really helpful because then like, for example, when you're setting up um, you know, the CCTV system, you don't have to set it up through like a Raspberry Pi or have different Raspberry Pis for different projects. You could just have a single server. Setting up a single server with a virtual environment means that it's even better because then if anything is going wrong in one of your servers, you can just delete it and try again. Um, so setting up a server with virtualization so that you can actually have your own containers is a really awesome project and I absolutely recommend it. Having a server is not as expensive as you might think at home. You can actually even get a really small one for like a couple of hundred bucks. Um, but it does need more skills. So the home server with virtualization does need more skills and I have linked my OER classes for this. So if this is something you are interested in, uh, you do have the ability to sort of work up to this. 
But this is one of the really great ways that you can protect your data and information is if you're running your own server, you can route all of your own information on there much easier and you don't have to rely on any of the other companies or other ways to do things. And it also can make things a lot more seamless in your house so that you aren't trying to sort of have all of these disparate pieces. Everything will come together a little easier. Um, Octoprint is kind of a cool IoT project. If you have a 3D printer or you're interested in getting into 3D printers, which they have been coming down so much in price. 3D printer is one of the really, really popular hobbyist ones is the Ender 3 that is regularly under 200 bucks. And Octoprint gives you the ability to monitor the printer remotely. You can monitor the temp of the hot end and the table. <coughs> Sorry, you can set up a camera to check on your prints. You can even create time lapses of your prints. So um, I've actually gone through how to do all of those things and put an example time lapse up so you can see what it would look like. This has a great community. This has a developer that is super into it. She seems awesome. They seem awesome. Um, if you end up doing Home Assistant, which I'll talk about in a minute, you can actually tie this in. And it's kind of a cool way to be able to make your own stuff in the real world. So if you are thinking about getting a 3D printer, upgrading it with setting up Octoprint as part of your IoT setup in your home can actually be a really cool way to do that. Um, okay, so air quality sensor. So the air quality sensor project that I did, this works best with a server. Uh, I actually used a cheapy air quality sensor from Ikea because I'm cheap. And so I actually just bought their off the shelf air quality sensor. Um, now for this project, the actual like difficulty of the project, I would say is not really high, but there's some soldering involved. So if you've never done soldering before, I would not recommend this as your first soldering project. I would try one of the like, you know, first soldering project buttons first. Um, you know, I mean, I guess biggest pro tip for soldering, no touchy hot end. Ouchie, ouchie, no, no. That's, you know, and as long as you don't do that and almost anything else can be fixed. Um, uh, there, there are a lot of pictures. I took a lot of pictures. Other people have taken a lot of pictures and videos. There are some really good resources. The chips that I the chip that I use is actually very cheap, so you can add these type of brains to other devices around the house. So it actually took an air quality sensor that was originally not part of the Internet of Things and turned it into an Internet of Things air quality sensor. So originally, the air quality sensor actually did it with colors. Um, you know, green was good, yellow was mediocre, red was bad. So adding in the chip that I did and programming that chip, I was actually able to get it to send all of the air quality information to the server so you can actually keep track of that. Um, I showed how to set up alerts so that you can actually have it alert the server um, or your phone so that if you start having air quality issues, you can get a nice alert on your phone for that. Um, and then you can actually like do things with your data because we all know data is awesome. So this is a really great way to be able to connect, collect some more data about your home. Also, you know, hmm, brains. Don't you want to add brains to stuff? They're tasty. Next, I have a portable CO2 monitor. So this project can potentially be a little bit more complicated. I used Adafruit hardware. Now, I used Adafruit hardware because they had everything for very reasonable prices, and it's also a really popular place for schools to get hardware, so it's usually on the approved list for a lot of educational institutions. The biggest downside to this project is actually the cost. Um, the actual CO2 monitor all by itself with nothing else is 60 bucks. So, um, you know, this is a little bit more on the expensive side, but if you want to do it just how I did it, it was actually very straightforward, pretty easy to hook up and it can be worn on a bracelet. That's how I ended up designing the housing. And you can actually see that I have the 3d printed housing options, um, also linked from this project and available on my Thingiverse profile. So if you wanted to 3D print your own containers, you can totally do that. The CO2 quality monitor 
by being a portable one actually has a battery that goes with it so you can take it anywhere you want to go and monitor that type of air around you. So you can actually do um, temp, humidity, CO2, and get that all set up. Uh, for this one, I actually also ended up adding a little screen to it so that it can actually give you some of this information. And then because I am me, it does air quality sensors by emojis. So um, if the emoji starts to look really angry at you, it's time to head out. So that is a good project and it can bring together some of the other projects. You don't need to have the server or anything for it. This you can choose to do with a 3D printer or you could make the case in another way. Uh, you can even do some of the plugs so you don't even necessarily have to do soldering. Like there's ways around the soldering, but I will say doing the soldering is a lot easier. Um, but yeah, okay, so Home Assistant. Home Assistant goes on your server. You can also put Home Assistant on like a Raspberry Pi or something, or if all of these sound awful to you, you can just buy Home Assistant. They actually sell a little pre-set up Home Assistant that you can just kind of plug in and start working with. Home Assistant is awesome for tying all of your IoT projects together. So if you wanted to have more control, see other projects, see other pieces, or even communicate with IoT projects that you bought from like companies, you can do that. However, I need to have a warning here. Just because it's connected to your home assistant does not mean it's secure. The more you can sort of make sure that your data, your information is getting routed through your own server, if you know what data is being collected and where it's going, that's going to be a more secure option. Uh, you can actually even make Home Assistant not connect with the outside. You can do it with just local Wi-Fi, um, but it gives you a really great centralized way to talk to and work with all of your IoT devices. So this is actually a really great project, especially if you already have a lot of IoT devices. This is a way to be able to work with them all together so that you don't have, you know, sort of like, oh, well, I have to use this app for these lights and then this app for that and this app for that. Uh, everything can come together on like one really nice dashboard. Just please be aware, just because it's an option doesn't mean it's secure. This is just a way for you to be able to keep things together, but you still have to pay attention to security and pay attention to the data and where the data is going. Okay, um, you. one of the other projects I did was actually setting up a media server. So it's your own music service. So if you didn't like, for example, whatever media service you're using right now for music, you can actually set up your own. Uh, there's a caveat here, of course, you need to have legal digital copies of your music. But there are things like, you know, radio stations, you can hook up your own subscription services. This works best on the server. I would strongly recommend setting this up on a home server of some variety. The biggest problem that I had with this is smart speakers. Um, spending money on smart speakers, they are surprisingly expensive. Phones, tablets, and computers connect to Logitech Media Server really quickly and easily. I got it working on the phones in the house, the laptops in the house, absolutely no problems. But trying to set it up to smart speakers in the house was actually a problem. The Wi-Fi speakers, the like cheapest ones that I could find were almost 200 bucks. So you might end up still having some cost issues. But like if you wanted to, for example, set up a media service so that you could listen to music throughout the house or have it follow you or set up services so that different music is playing in different areas, like that's all an option through here. And you don't have to worry about like subscriptions if you have digital copies and you don't have to worry about like who's tracking what you're listening to, how many times you're listening to it ads, things like that. However, I have a huge caveat here. I am not an audiophile in any way, shape, or form. I thought the streaming quality was fine. However, I have never in my entire life bought a vinyl for the sound quality, man, ever. So it is possible that you will go through this and you'll do this and you'll be like, wow, I don't know what she was talking about. This is awful and I can't even listen. I have no idea. Um, the two people that are in my house, neither one of us are audiophiles and, um, we both thought it was fine, but you know, buyer beware. Okay. 
So lastly, how to figure out if you can secure the devices that you already have. So maybe you don't want to do all of this. Maybe you don't want to go through and set up all of these different IoT things that I set up in my home. Okay, cool. Um, first, does your device have a required app? If it has a required app, it's probably not a great option because it's a lot harder to secure those required apps. You also have to secure your phone. And frankly, most of them are, they just slurp up data. So they save data, they send data, they sell data. It's not great. If your device has a required website login, this is really popular on cameras, they might be literally unfixable. It is completely possible that the company has locked the hardware down so much that they are literally useless if you do not use their website login or app. At that point, that device is not securable. There are no options and it's literally not fixable. You would have to get another one if you wanted to make it secure. If you read in the instructions on device setup, a really good thing to do before buying a device is go through the setup instructions. If you see anything that says bypass security restrictions on your router or firewall, if there is a special setup requiring that you bypass any of these, just say no. That means the company does not care about security. Security is in no way, shape, or form that is important to them. They do not care about it. They do not care about you. They don't care if you get hacked. They don't care if the device ends up being part of a botnet and spamming people. They do not care. Don't do it. If your device has the option for an app, but it's not required, that device is probably a better choice because it means you have other options and other ways to be able to make sure that you know what's being collected and where that data is going. Another option for a lot of the devices at home is actually locking the device away from the internet in general by preventing that device's IP address from accessing the internet at large. This will require a special setup on your router where you can basically have like a special Wi-Fi that cannot go to the, you know, outside world um, and you can connect all of your devices there. This does have the caveat that there are several devices that don't want you to do this so hard that they will stop working. Some companies want to make sure that they are able to collect that data, your data, come hell or high water. And so if you try to block it from accessing the internet, the entire device will actually brick itself. Um, and you'll sometimes see that in the reviews for the devices. Sometimes you'll see that um, in the setup for the devices, like, you know, caution, make sure that it can connect to the internet. Some devices are just useless without the internet. Like, you know, if the entire purpose of the device is to say, you know, hey, so-and-so, play me some music. Like, None of that is happening locally. The voice recording is happening and then being sent somewhere. The interpretation of what you're actually saying is happening elsewhere. The music that is being chosen is happening elsewhere. Like none of that is happening locally. So that device is a brick without internet access elsewhere. Um, the entire purpose is that it is connecting somewhere else. So you know, you have to be a little bit careful with that because um, some devices you can lock away, but some devices will just literally not work. Okay, so let's say you have gotten through this entire video and you're like, yes, I want more. Um, I have a website where I have a whole section on my smart home. I have some OER materials. If you want to have a little bit more, I guess, skills before trying some of these, that's cool too. Um, that's available here. You can just, you know, type in the link, scan the QR code, whatever. Um, go to my website, read about the smart home and see all of my write-ups. So I hope this was helpful. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. And I hope that you will try securing some of the devices that you already have and maybe try buying some new devices that are more secure in the future. Thank you. And I hope you're all having a lovely day.